Ladies and gentlemen, you are very welcome to this uh, webinar organized by the Institute of Latin, uh, Nordic Institute of Latin American Studies together with the Center for De Development and the Environment at the University of Oslo. This seminar that will be about Latin America and the US election. My name is Magnus Lemke. I will be the moderator tonight and I am a, a political scientist. I am a teacher and a researcher here at the Nordic Institute of Latin American Studies at Stockholm University. For those of you who are not familiar with us, we are an institute that we are conducting research. We, we have a education for a, a graduate and advanced studies here at the university. And we are also, we are also have a long tradition of having open seminars. Now, when we have the uh, the coronavirus, we have started with this webinar series, but we are very glad to be able to continue. And uh, today we have a very interesting topic to discuss, the US election. And uh, according to many, this is, uh, will be maybe the most important election in the history of the United States. Some say that, well, that we can discuss, but obviously it will have enormous consequences for international relations, depending on whether Trump or Biden wins the election. What consequences will it have for Latin America? Well, we can have some qualified guesses because we know rather much about Biden after eight years as vice president in the Obama administration. And of course, we also know Donald Trump after four years as president. But still, it is an important question to ask, what will the result of the election mean for Latin America? And I am very pleased to be able to present to you a very distinguished panel with expertise in this particular uh, theme. First of all, I want to present to you Monica Hertz. Welcome to you, who is an associate professor at the Catholic University of Rio de Janeiro with a PhD from the London School of Economics and Political Science. Her focus, among other things, are international organizations, global governance, Latin American security, and Brazilian foreign policy. I'm also Equally pleased to introduce to you Christopher Sabatini, who is a senior, uh, welcome Christopher, who is a senior researcher, senior research fellow for Latin America at the Royal Institute of International Studies in London and previously instructor of international affairs at Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs. He writes regularly for uh, journals and newspapers such as Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, Royal Politics Review, New York Times, Washington Post, and Miami Herald. And uh, he is also the founder and former editor of America's Quarterly. Third, equally important, I want to introduce to you Benedict de Bull. Welcome to you. She is I have to say it most importantly, the president of the board of my institute, the Nordic Institute of Latin American Studies, but she's also professor of political science at the Center for Development and the Environment, our co-organizer this night at the University of Oslo and former director of the Norwegian Latin American Research Network, NULARNET, as well as former head of the Oslo Academy of Global Governance. Benedicte focuses, among other things, on development, institutions, environmental governance, and political economy in Latin America and in international institutions, with a particular focus on elites and inequality. And also, he's speaking about countries with a particular interest in Central America, Chile, and Venezuela, among other countries. Last but not least, I want to welcome uh, Monica Serrano. Welcome to you who is professor of international relations and researcher at El Colegio de Mexico, also senior fellow at Rolf Bunch Institute, associate fellow of the International Institute for Strategic Studies and senior research associate at the Center for International Studies, Oxford University. 
and also international relations. Uh, she, she, her focuses are, among other things, international relations of Latin America and North America, with particular reference to international institutions, security, human rights, and transnational crime. We will have a discussion tonight, uh, approximately or one hour of a discussion, in which each of the panelists will respond to a, a couple of questions that I will start by asking them. And they will have three to four minutes each to answer them. And after we have heard all the four panelists on each question, so after each question, uh, that session, we will open up for maybe other the members of the, poll, of the panel will comment on each other. Maybe I have a question or maybe the audience, you are also well welcome here between the different questions to intervene with your questions if you want. So write them in the, in the, in the chat. So uh, I have nothing else to say. Let's start this interesting discussion. And as I said, I have a question to start with. And uh, that question is, what are the most important issues in the relationship between the United States and Latin America from your point of view, that is from your geographical, for example, point of view. And uh, shall we start, for example, I'm looking at the screen and up there in the left corner, we have Benedicte. Do you want to start to discuss, uh, to, to comment on, on this uh, rather broad question, but still important? Okay, thank you very much, Magnus. I can start. Um, so I was thinking, what would be my geographical standpoint? Because I am uh, uh, based in Oslo, and I'm also the director of the board of the Nordic Institute, but I'm following particularly Venezuela and uh, still Central America is very close to my heart. So although that it's a little while since I did real research there, but I think um, I'm going to try to combine it. And as a Nordic, uh, from a Nordic standpoint, I would say that the issue of multilateralism is on, on the top of the agenda, uh, which is a natural consequence of the Nordic countries being very small countries. Small states always want strong institutions and, and rules. Big states often don't want that. But the Nordic countries is also very well known in Latin America, at least, for, for uh, prioritizing issues such as human rights, democracy, peace, uh, gender equality, indigenous right, rights, and to less extent, I would say, but still a uh, better distribution. I would say that these are kind of issues that are important. Should I speak only for my country? we don't even have a Latin America policy, but that's a whole different issue that I can talk about later. So when I comment on what I think it are the most important issues for Central America and Venezuela, it will be kind of with Nordic eyes. Uh, because especially when it comes to Venezuela, it's very hard to say what are the most important issues for Venezuela, because of course, Venezuela is extremely divided. So some issues would be important, completely unimportant for, for some people and very important for others. But if I should start with Central America, I think I would mention four issues and they're very interrelated. Uh, of course, migration is uh, on the top of the agenda in Central America, and that is, because maybe that is the, that has been one of the major focuses uh, of Trump's uh, administration. Uh, uh, maybe also related to the fact that uh, the Trump administration hasn't really had a foreign policy. It's more kind of prior, uh, priorities based on what is important for the national domestic agenda. And of course, migration is really important. More specifically for the Central Americas, it's the issue of the asylum cooperation agreements. We can get, come back to that, that Trump um, pressured through last year. It's also uh, the issue of the, um, of the TPS that Trump has decided that the temporary protected status that Trump decided to withdraw for Salvadorans and Guatemalans. Now that has not yet been implemented. It's still held up in courts, um, but that would be very important for a lot of, uh, lot of families, but also for the governments. And uh, part of the reason is of course that several, uh, I'm thinking they're talking about 200,000 Salvadorans that would be sent back. 
And we should always keep in mind that for the Northern Triangle of Central America, um, about 20% of their GDP is based on the remittances from the migrants abroad. So uh, and the second issue I would say is aid. And those things are, are connected because Trump, as some might remember, held up uh, like 500, uh, 450 million dollars in aid uh, uh, as a condition for um, for pressuring through these migrant agreements, um, and uh, and Biden has promised. Uh, Biden actually that was part of the the aid that Biden had previously managed to push through, and uh, he has promised a huge aid, aid, pack, aid package to Central America should he be elected. And the migrant agreements, for those that are not familiar with those, I should also mention that those involve that the migrants that come from uh, Honduras and El Salvador through Guatemala has to apply for the asi for asylum in, in Guatemala. It's created a huge pressure on Guatemala because of their, their uh, geographical uh, situation. Um, uh, the the third question I would I would uh, mention is uh, the question of anti-corruption schemes, and those are of course not important for everybody. They're not very important for the governments, but they're important for uh, a lot of the people. And uh, the U.S. supported uh, anti-corruption institutions along with the U.N. and other countries in Guatemala, a much weaker one. The, in Honduras, they were both shut down uh, uh, through the, just a few years ago. Well, the CC in Guatemala last year, the Maki had a Maki had a kind of slower death. But these were efforts uh, that were strongly supported by the U.S. before Trump in the region. Now um, there is a hope that uh, with a new administration, there would be more support to that. That is one part of the anti-corruption. Uh, anti-corruption efforts by the United States. The other part is, of course, that that's what is conducted by the U.S. justice system within um, within the United States, and that has gone on, and that has affected, for example, Panama, uh, since the president of the Panama was extradited, ex-president, sorry, um, uh, Martinelli was extradited to the United States. So there's two sides of this. So these are some of the uh, the most important and linked to those anti-corruption schemes is also the issue of democracy that I would say that is very important for a lot of Central Americans, not necessarily the government, because they're worried that the Trump administration has supported very authoritarian leaders such as Juan um, Orlando Hernandez in Honduras and also not least Nayib Bukele in El Salvador. I see that my time is running out so I'm, and I need to touch briefly on Venezuela, I would say that for Venezuela, um, there's the, the election in the US is really important. But, and I would say the overwhelming majority of, uh, this is hard to really know, the Venezuelans in the US tend to, to support Trump. Uh, a year and a half ago, I think it was that Pew had a, uh, had a re did a research in Venice, in Latin America about the support for Trump, the Trump administration showing that the only country in the region where Trump had a certain popularity was actually Venezuela because many people there had hopes that he would uh, contribute to um, to a change in government and a return to democracy. Now that didn't happen, so I wouldn't know how that would have shaken out today. But um, of course, the issue of sanction, sanctions is very important. Um, I can come back to the kind of the sanctions policy of the different candidates. But I think that, uh, that uh, uh, there is a, uh, the issue of what role uh, the US would play in a transition to a democracy or a, a kind of a, a way out of the Venezuelan crisis is of course on the top of the agenda. And that has a lot of aspects to it. Sanctions is on the top, but also of course issues such as uh, their role in a uh, possible dialogue, uh, military threats, or whether that would be off the agenda. Um, so those, and of course also the issue of a TPS, 
the the, uh, the temporary protected status that Venezuelans as of now uh, do not have in the U.S. and that Biden has promised that he would uh, prom uh, give them. So those, I think, would be the most important issues from those geographical standpoints. Sorry, I had some problem with my microphone. Thank you very much, uh, Benedicte. And uh, I think it, it seems natural now to go to Monica Serrano in, in terms of uh, Mexico being in the proximity of, uh, of, of Central America and also being uh, that included into the whole migratory problem between uh, uh, Mexico, Central America and United States. So please, Monica. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to join you even if it's in this virtual format, I very much wish that uh, we will be able to soon get back to some kind of normality that will not be life as we used to, to know it, but that will at least hopefully allow us to meet again somewhere. So let me uh, try to share with you a few reflections on uh, what the election means and the Trump administration has meant for US-Mexican relations. And in trying to respond the question as to what is the most important urgent issue, uh, from a Mexican perspective, it's very difficult to um, single out one issue because of the nature of the relationship. The relationship creates a situation in which uh, most of the problems facing the two countries are intermestic in nature, meaning that even they are uh, somehow foreign in nature, they have a domestic dimension and, and the transnational logics linking the two countries mean that uh, they share uh, agenda. So to give you one example, just over the past weeks, we've seen demonstrations uh, of farmers in Northern Mexico protesting uh, about what has been a normal standard practice between the two countries uh, that was a result of an enlightened period in US-Mexican relations that led to an agreement to share the water uh, in, uh, of rivers along the border and that compels Mexico to hand over every five years, I believe, um, a certain amount of water. Given the, the dry season and the drought, uh, Mexican farmers were protesting at uh, the, the, the contributions that their estates were meant and expected to give to this uh, uh, delivery of water. Uh, so uh, water, illicit drugs uh, and, and drug trafficking. Again, just 10 days or so ago, we witnessed the arrest, the unprecedented arrest and, and very controversial arrest of the ex-minister of defense in Los Angeles, who is now being taken to New York uh, uh, and who will be facing charges in the same court that has processed uh, the ex-trafficker uh, now in prison, uh, El Chapo Guzman, the ex-head of the Mexican top federal police, uh, Genaro Garcia Luna, and now the ex-Defense Minister, uh, General Cienfuegos. Um, this not only reveals the gravity of and, and the urgency of the drug theme in the bilateral relationship that over the past decades has linked the two countries in an organic and very tense dynamic uh, as the opiates, the three cycles of the opiates crisis in the U.S., has impacted on Mexico, opening up criminal opportunities for uh, criminal organizations to engage uh, yet again in the trafficking and the supply of heroin to US addicts uh, who were no longer able, able to secure the substances they needed because they were addicts in US chemists because of a regulation imposed by President Obama in 2010 that clamped down on legal prescriptions and by clamping down then shifted those addicts to illicit uh, venues and outlets and opened up criminal opportunities to Mexico. 
and Mexican criminal organizations, in Mexico and to Mexican criminal organizations. Migration, another fundamentally important issue in the bilateral relation, one that has experienced very bitter moments over the past years, but that cannot only be explained by the legacy of Trump and the prospects of a continuity of Trump in the, in the White House. Um, migration has not only tensed US-Mexican relations, but has also shifted the social fabric and the face of the US in ways that we could not have imagined just 20 years ago. Uh, over the past uh, years before Trump's inauguration in 2017, uh, migration became a very contested and increasingly contested issue in the US, dividing positions uh, with those who, as Biden just now has again pledged, who realized that not only the human, but the practical solution to a demographic trend in the US was to try to open up avenues to a citizenship and to legal residence to undocumented migrants um, in the US. And let me give you some figures um, to show how uh, this problem affects the relationship and affects domestic dynamics, domestic political dynamics in the two countries, illustrating in turn the interdomestic nature of the relationship. It, in, in 2012, the last census, uh, the number of legal Mexican residents in the US was estimated in 11 million people. And if we add to this number, the 19 million of Mexican Americans, the total population of Mexican origin in the US reaches 13 million. This figure must have increased by now, given that I'm talking about figures that are uh, eight years old, 2012. Um, this 30 million population of Mexican origin represented in that year 64% of the Hispanic population in the US or 9% of the total US population. And the political significance of this population has been increasingly uh, salient in the US. In 2012, it was already clear that uh, the Hispanic vote would reach by now 25%. Some argue that it's already in the order of nearly 30%. And it had already opened the doors uh, to of the US Congress to 20, 28 Hispanic members of the House of Representatives to three Hispanic senators and had played a determinant role, a determining role in key states, including Florida, Colorado, and Nevada, had helped President Obama secure two uh, uh, consecutive elections and had swung local political dynamics, including in Arizona, where the Hispanic population two years ago already represented over 30% of the total population and uh, nearly 22% of the state's electorate and had already been able to put an end to the controversial reign of uh, one of the most um, horrendous uh, political figures, officials in the US, Sheriff Arpaio, who had no qualms in uh, using racial profiling to target immigrants. So in the context of the current election, we are seeing how uh, the two contenders, Biden and uh, Trump, are uh, fighting to, to, to try to secure a victory in Florida. Texas is another state that Democrats have been expecting to turn blue um, for many years now, we'll see what happens. Um, there are still pockets in the Hispanic population that are very supportive of Trump, but certainly there are younger generations that have been the most vocal voices against the racism and the xenophobia that Trump opened up 
uh, during four years um, in the White House. This in turn created a, a very paradoxical situation in Mexico in which NAFTA, the free trade agreement that uh, really provided a, a fundamentally important institutional platform to manage the, bilat the bilateral relation, and that uh, it resulted in, in very significant and impressive uh, uh, increments in trade, in foreign investment, and uh, the, the participation of the region of North America in global trade. Paradoxically, the social, political, and economic dynamics unleashed by NAFTA created a situation in which Mexican officials had to exert discipline and to endure stoically the most controversial uh, types of behavior, for instance, during electoral seasons, where Mexico continuously was bashed, when the question of the wall, even before Trump, was became an electoral uh, agenda uh, flag, or uh, uh, where increasingly inhuman migration policies were imposed on Mexico and Mexicans. Let us not forget that under Obama, according to the US Homeland Security uh, Department, 3 million Mexicans were deported. According to the Mexican National Migration Institute, 3.8 million people were deported. And even though Obama claimed that in the last years of his administration, he had shifted to a selective deportation policy by which only uh, undocumented migrants with serious criminal records would be reported. The figures show that in 2015, 90.5% of those arrested and returned at, and returned at the border. Uh, and in 2016, 84.8% were reported due to their illegal status, not to um, a, a criminal record. The same goes for illicit drugs. Um, Biden in 2012 landed in Mexico and Central America to warn authorities who were then very eagerly trying to make a shift in drug policy led by the then Mexican president Calderon, ex-president Santos from Colombia and ex-president Perez Molina from Guatemala leading a very strong vocal a stand to discuss and change drug policy. And in that context, Biden landed in Mexico to say no to a change in drug policy, no to the efforts of the region to try to legalize marijuana for recreational purposes, even though it is now perfectly legal in many, many states um, in the US. You will have the possibility to continue when we ask the next question. Yeah. This is also included in that. But I think this is a good point to go over to Christopher, partly based on what Benedict said about democracy the possibilities of democratic transition in Venezuela, but also uh, considering the Latino vote in the United States, that is Christopher and uh, perhaps on Cuba or Please, the word is yours. Thank you, Magnus, and, and greetings from, I'm on vacation, but it's an indication of how much this means to me that I'm willing to and excited to, to phone in and join you. So thank you for the invitation. Um, let me ask, refer back to your original question, because it gets at uh, some of this, which is one of the most important issues in the bilateral relationship, or the relationship rather, between Latin America and uh, the United States. And let me answer by what the Trump's, Trump administration's priorities are. Uh, they're not mine. So let me just say in advance that I'm not a priority. I'm not defending them. The first is, and it gets to your point about your question about Cuba and Venezuela. The first priority this Trump administration has when it comes to the region is first rewarding and now securing a block of Florida voters, primarily in Miami-Dade County. Trump won Florida's 29 electoral votes by only 113,000 votes out of 14 million, okay? The swing votes in many cases came from the panhandle. He's guaranteed those. But the solid block of often Republican voters 
come from Miami Dade and in that and, and a little in North as well. Those are those swing key voters are Cuban American and Venezuelan American and a certain degree Colombian American who for whom battling communism, revenge against genuine autocrats often is more important than effective policy <laughs> and is often the driving factor when it comes to whom they support in the presidential elections. And because of that, what we saw in July 2017 was Trump traveling to Florida in appearing before a group of uh, uh, um, uh, Bay of Pigs veterans to announce the rolling back of U.S. liberalization measures that occurred under Obama towards Cuba. Okay, And we've seen a similar get tough policy with Venezuela and also with Nicaragua, in which John Bolton famously alliteratively referred to them as the Troika of Tyranny, the Three Stooges of Socialism, and the, there's another one, Menage a Trois of Menace. No, I made that one up. He didn't say that. What he actually said was, was um, the triangle of uh, terrorism. Um, and in those cases, what he promised, and he of course made that delivery in Florida, what he promised in those cases was they would be gone by the end of the Trump administration. They're still there, okay? Now, the other thing that drives the Trump administration's perspectives towards Latin America is very much driven by that as well. It's that all, all matters revolve around those three countries. The other thing is keeping out external influence in the region, China in particular. You heard former Secretary of State stop in University of Texas, Austin, Rex Tillerson was his name, and declare that he was resurrecting the Monroe Doctrine from, it had been buried a few years earlier by, by uh, Secretary of State John Kerry. He resurrected it, it's been repeated by John Bolton, it was repeated by Donald Trump, and the idea is they want to keep Chinese influence out. This is a very Cold War mentality, very much driven, not just by the number of Cuban Americans who are in this administration, placed there largely because, again, paying back debts to that community and to, in particular, to Senator Rubio, um, but also the vision and the legacy they bring with them of this idea that what matters most is protecting the U.S.'s southern flank. And there's a third uh, element of the, of the uh, Trump administration's priorities towards the region, and that is obviously immigration and blocking immigration, though it does not, curiously, apply as much when it comes to Cuban Americans. Cuban Americans largely are not driven by the sorts of uh, uh, concerns that Monica mentioned. Many of them, you know, Latin American and the Hispanic community in the U.S. is very diverse. They don't vote as a block. And Cuban Americans and Venezuelans, for them, battling communism is more important than defending the rights of others who arrive from the United States whose names may also end in Z or O or what have you, uh, that is not their priority. So question is, what's gonna drive it? A Biden policy um, would be going back to the o Obama opening up and liberalization towards Cuba. The belief is, is that over after over 60 years, basically a policy of containment, isolation, and basically revenge has failed to uh, unseat and it's time for a different policy. And the belief is, is that with openness, particularly with a community of more than a million Cuban Americans just 90 miles off the coast of Cuba, that flow of information, that flow of people, those flow of culture and ideas will help foster the levels of independence and civil society that it will be necessary for a long-term political, peaceful political change in Cuba. Um, it isn't always clear that the idea was a peaceful political change, certainly not in the early 60s, uh, but even now. Um, so that will be what will, but it will drive the Biden administration much, much less than the Trump administration. If Biden has already staked his claim to the Cuban American vote and the Florida vote generally on reopening relations with Cuba, but obviously he has a larger and a broader agenda. Um, that includes, as Benedicta mentioned, uh, development in Central America, returning to the, pro the Partnership for Prosperity. It means addressing issues of development. It means addressing issues of collaboration on human rights in a nonpartisan or non-ideological fashion. That is to say, calling out dictators, yes, in Venezuela, yes, in Cuba, yes, in Nicaragua, but also with the same vigor, dictators in Honduras, in Brazil, and yes, repression in Colombia and the failure to live up to uh, peace accords. So this is, you know, it's a much broader agenda than the very narrow enemy us versus them focus, whether the us is Americans or 
freedom loving capitalists against those, those repressive communists, or whether the them is those repressive communists, the triangle of tyranny or what have you, and immigrants. I'll end on one last thing quickly. Uh, and I always say, because in, in among, when we talk to Latin American politicians and they say, con eso termino, with this I finish, it means they're not gonna finish anytime soon. I'm gonna finish with this. Um, which is to say, you know, many of the things that a Biden team or like many of the things that Benedicta and others have talked about will precisely accomplish the very things the Trump administration has tried to pursue, but using the wrong and limited tool set, okay? It has used sanctions, isolation, a unilateral policy, and a very, very divisive approach to the region. Approaching and building multilateral alliances, coordinating, cooperating with like-minded governments on issues of human rights, on issues of anti-corruption, on issues of approaching human rights, say, in Cuba, and cooperating with them on development will be key. And, I'll, and it's important in the COVID, we haven't mentioned COVID-19. According to the IMF statistics from a few weeks ago, the region is going to contract economically by 9.3%. And it's in wildly optimistic projections will return to growth in 2021. I find that hard to believe, but that means it's since reinstated now says an 8% contraction. What that means though, is that 20, I mean, rather 50 million people are at risk of falling back into poverty in the region. And it means also <clears throat> that there, this will wipe out two decades of economic growth, some of the best economic growth that happened in modern times since the lost decade of the 1980s. All this is to say this is gonna require more than doing battle with Cuba and the autocrats to control Cuba with Nicolas Maduro and against Daniel Ortega. This is going to require a comprehensive effort to partner and foster development. And to be quite frank, to be able to have a certain level of empathy for the struggles of the hardest hit region in the world when it comes to COVID, both in economic terms and in infection terms. Thanks. Thank you very much, Christopher. And now, of course, if we are discussing what are the central issues in the relationship between the United States and Latin America, it is particularly interesting to listen to what, uh, what from the Brazilian horizon, thinking about Bolsonaro sometimes being uh, discussed as similar ideologically to Trump. So Monica Hertz, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you for having me. Yeah, this has been uh, very interesting until now. I don't think I have anything else to say because you, you've, you've, you've covered it all, but I'll try to add. Um, I think that it's important in understanding US Latin American relations now to look into this mind frame, you called it ideological, I'm not sure I like that word, but to this uh, mind frame that uh, brings uh, Bolsonaro, Brazilian, the Brazilian president and uh, the Trump administration close together. It's not the only thing, but I think it's important. Uh, this uh, very conservative authoritarian mind frame that uh, has been spreading that has constituted a transnational alliance of which Brazil is a very important member at this point in time against human rights, against reproductive rights, uh, against uh, uh, LGBT rights. I mean, all this uh, sort of progressive agenda that has a uh, uh, has found room within also the, the, the UN system is being very, very strongly uh, fought against. I mean, uh, and, and I think this mind frame it has to, we have to look into it, we have to be careful, we have to really understand what it means. And to go back to what Benedict was saying, I mean, it is profoundly anti-multilateral not only because it is anti-UN or anti-international organizations, but because it is, it's, it's actually more profound. It's anti any collective institutions, collective institutions in each of the countries where these groups became uh, very influential and very powerful. It is all about 
focusing on the traditional family, the, 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 the guarantee of order, security, stability should be the traditional family. So this very, very conservative view of society. Uh, this, uh, now you could put it into a dream of going back, back to the 1950s. And I think uh, this, this, this mind frame, this conservative authoritarian mind frame uh, has become very influential, of course, in the United States, also in Brazil, foreign policy in the Brazilian case is particularly uh, relevant for the advance of this agenda. So in, 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 in this terms, I don't think this conservative agenda or the transnational alliance is going away, but of course, the result of the American elections will make a huge difference in terms of how far this can go. And uh, the second point I would make related to this is within the context of this very anti-multilateral, anti-international corporation logic, which of course has had a direct impact on how COVID is, is being dealt with and fought. We just have to look at what the Brazilian and American positions regarding the uh, World Health Organization today. Uh, it's it's uh, quite clear that uh, the, the result of the election will have a, a, a very significant impact on how these multilateral governance, transnational governance me mechanisms work in the region. Because, uh, uh, and, and I think that has a, will have a direct impact on how we administer the crisis in Venezuela. Uh, the crisis in Venezuela needs to be tackled within the context of uh, multilateral, uh, or at least a very uh, significant cooperation between uh, different actors in the region, not only states, but also from civil society. I think that we don't have a plan, we don't have a path ahead because there hasn't been an investment. In particular, it is clear from, that the Trump administration and the Brazilian uh, Bolsonaro administration are very much against making uh, in, in a, a significant investment in a path ahead that goes through negotiations, mediation, involvement of civil society, and all this will be necessary for us to have a peaceful transition uh, towards uh, a, a democratic regime in Venezuela. And I think the the, the same may you know, apply to the, the, the case of, of Cuba. I think that this uh, uh, traditionalist authoritarian mind frame has an impact on these discussions also in terms of uh, functioning within the grammar of the enemy. And, uh, and you, you all, I think, mentioned this in one way or the other, but I think it's really, really deep. This idea that you organize a Schmidtian uh, concept of politics, you organize political life domestically, but also internationally in terms of uh, the enemy. Who are the enemies? I mean, it, it can be the migrants, it can be Venezuela, Cuba, and Nicaragua. You know, uh, you can all, always find an enemy, right? So it's this, this, this grammar, this logic that really drives the Trump administration and drives the Brazilian uh, foreign policy at this point in time. So I think, the, and of course, the grammar of the enemy always opens up uh, the window for the use of violence. Uh, that this doesn't necessarily happen but it does open the room, the, the, the a window for the use of violence. That's one of the reasons why I think we have to be extremely concerned. The last point I want to mention very, very briefly, uh, Magnus, is that uh, you cannot understand this relationship without taking into account the dispute, conflict, tensions between the US and China and how 
Uh, they acquired a certain expression in the region. You know, we can talk about the Panama Canal, the, the canal, the, so, the future to be canal in Nicaragua. We can talk about investment, about commerce, about uh, uh, presence in, in the South Atlantic. I think many, many different things. I think that this, of course, will be with us for many, many years. And I think that Biden and Trump will administer this uh, situation, this systemic uh, dispute within our region in very different uh, manners. But of course, we can go back to this in the discussion. Thank you very much, Monica. And that was uh, precisely my next question that has to do with global geopolitics in Latin America and the, uh, the result of the US election and the impact that that will have on US, Russia, China, Latin American relations. A broad question, and maybe you can speculate a little bit. Also, we have some uh, questions from the audience. So I think we take a last round uh, with you, the panelist, and you think about the question I asked, and also uh, two questions from the audience. The first one is, if we take my now Mexico-United States relations, if we take away the issue of migration, how would a Biden victory change trade relations between Mexico and United States? And also, and the other question regards the Inter-American Inter Development Bank and how uh, the rule of the International uh, Inter American Development Bank, and particularly the tradition of having a Latin American as president of EDB. Will there be any changes in this regard if Biden takes power? So very short now because we are running out of time, but you can choose, uh, this is three questions, choose the one you are most uh, familiar with. And uh, let's start with uh, Benedicta, please. Thank you for letting me go first again. Um, uh, how to frame this? I think um, there's there's so many questions related to to the changing geopolitical situation, and I think uh, one big question is whether uh, we could see a restoration of a kind of multilateralism in Latin America with a Biden admini administration. It's obvious it's not gonna happen under Trump. It's not his, his interest, it's, it's not on the agenda. Could we see kind of restored uh, institutions and, uh, and a, a kind of um, closer cooperation the way that he argues in his program, for example. I think there's a lot of different obstacles to that, uh, in addition to, to the political will. One is the deep split between the different countries in the region. Uh, and to, to link up to the issue of the, the IDB, uh, what we saw a few weeks ago when Trump's candidate, Clave Carona, was elected, uh, was of course a, a totally um, uh, unacceptable imposition by the by the United States, but it was also helped by the fact that the Latin American countries couldn't agree between themselves, and that is not going to change anytime very soon. I think that the uh, Biden administration would have a very different kind of uh, relationship to the bank, but now uh, Clavel Caron is already elected, so that and that is not going to be uh, on the changed either anytime very soon. So I think that is. One, uh, one major obstacle. Another obstacle, it's simply that if you look at the plans that the US has launched now very lately, they've understood, or at least there's a, at least some tiny signs that they've tried not only to use threats to get their way in Latin America the way they have over the last years, but also presented this uh, Latin America growth program with different new kind of investment initiatives, but it's always based on providing incentives to the private sector, maybe a little bit of, of loans. And, and it just can't compete in any way with the Chinese uh, massive flow of, of investment and loans and that's much more tangible. And then kind of for very pragmatic businessmen and, and political elites in Latin America, that will be probably more attractive than some, some idea of some possible private, private investment. So I think that is also a major uh, a possible obstacle. I think it's really important, but 
I could to try to be a little bit optimistic going back to Venezuela. I think that one that the US has not only in Venezuela in many parts of the world really uh, kind of helped this geopolitical transition along through their uh, sanctions policy that have uh, have uh, kind of pushed a lot of countries more towards Russia, towards Iran, in the case of Venezuela, obviously uh, that is the case. Biden has said that he will strengthen the individual sanctions against uh, people in the in in the Maduro government and his circle. Uh, also, try to impose multilateral sanctions, but reduce the pressure on those very strict financial. Uh, he hasn't actually said that explicitly, so it's still a bit up for interpretations. But if you could move towards a more multilateral less emphasis on sanction, more multilateral, uh, and some kind of understanding with the Chinese. I think that is maybe the only hope that the international community can really, the Chinese and a lot of other actors, of course, but that relationship is, is very important and that maybe could generate some kind of opening for a multilateral solution uh, or contribution to a sol contribution to, because the solution always has to come from inside still. Uh, of Venezuela, but lots of different obstacles and the COVID-19 crisis, it's major. And of course that will provide, a, will create a lot of, lot more need in the region for, for money and an opening for uh, Chinese influence if the US doesn't change something very significant. Thank you. Uh, Monica, Serrano, do you want to add to any of these three questions? Yeah, I mean, uh, Again, trying to add to the question of multilateral, or to answer the question of the prospects for, multi for multilateralism in the region, um, I would share the, the skepticism already expressed by Benedict. Um, it's clear that multilateralism has not always been catalyzed by the US. It has, in many occasions, certainly, when it comes to the agenda of human rights or democracy, it has been clearly helped by an enlightened regional policy by the US, but it has not always been exclusively dependent upon US leadership. The golden years of Contadora in dealing with the Central American crisis back in the 1980s were an exceptional moment of regionalism and Latin American multilateralism, and that is not in sight today. It is really a very a upsetting to see how Latin America contrasts, for instance, with uh, the African continent when it comes to a regional response to COVID. Uh, the, the way in which regional leadership and institutions were mobilized in Africa partly explains that that continent with comparatively more disadvantages um, re, uh, in, a, in a more disadvantageous position and, and with less resources accounts for 3.5% of global deaths and 17% of global population, whereas Latin America with 8% of the population accounts for over 30% of, of global COVID deaths. Um, in, in relation to multilateralism, in addition to the split that Benedicta has mentioned, I would add the fact that we have now a president who consistently repeats that the best foreign policy is domestic policy and has shown little or no interest in multilateralism at the regional or the global level. Um, one just needs to listen to his speech at the General Assembly just in September to realize that he's completely uninterested and, and out of touch. Um, just a few lines on China um, in relation to Mexico. I think the presence of China in Mexico uh, has been more contained by the simple fact that Mexico and China compete for access um, to the US market. And the renegotiation of NAFTA in the new US-Mexico-Canada trade agreement has increased the uh, rules on uh, regional content, which means that imports or, or outsourcing from China uh, will be uh, limited and it will be more difficult to uh, draw on Chinese imports to manufacture goods that are part of the supply chains uh, in North America. So uh, I don't think that China will be a, a major factor, even though we've seen 
gestures, including um, uh, in the context of the COVID crisis, uh, the supply of medical equipment and, and medical gear. Thank you very much, Monica. Very interesting. And now, Christopher, do you have anything to add from your perspective? Yes, thank you, Magnus. Very quickly, um, the first is that um, there is a need for global uh, geopolitics to be reconsidered, but I think the multilateral institutions in the region are fundamentally broken. Um, we've seen OAS and, and, and uh, Secretary General Amadro, who's tried at times and raised the issue of Venezuela, but uh, has stumbled uh, uh, and actually did as well in Honduras, but has been whipsawed by uh, his attempt to be independent and then at times being co-opted by the administration, the Trump administration. Um, and we've seen, of course, uh, Venezuela is pulling out of the, of, of the OAS and uh, the Dominican Republic, Nicaragua and uh, Venezuela are also pulling out, uh, Dominican Republic are pulling out of the Inter-American System of Human Rights with the Trump administration who hasn't officially pulled out but refuses to attend meetings of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, demonstrating once again that human rights violations make for odd bedfellows. Um, on the IDB, I actually wrote an op-ed about the nomination now confirmed uh, of, of uh, Mauricio Clava Caron. Uh, I'm probably not gonna be welcome anytime soon in the halls of the IDB. I will say this, it isn't just that he was American that broke the tradition. It was, this is a man who has dedicated his entire life to defending the US embargo, not even human rights in Cuba, but the embargo, a one man lobbying shop that, opera, that was lobbying and, and actually accused of taking foreign money and not declaring it. And he's going to sit atop, he is sitting atop a development bank that loans $13 billion a year annually on the high end years. Um, and, but that is dedicated to issues of inclusion, racial, gender, uh, uh, inclusion, LGBT rights, uh, issues of the environment and sustainable development, issues of, um, sustainable cities. These are not things, let's be honest, the Trump administration has been a leader on globally, to put it lightly. And the fact that its nominee, irrespective of his nationality, is now sitting atop a development bank is that is also underqualified is, is appalling. Now, some in the Biden administration are planning, and I have a couple friends there, uh, Biden administration, I guess I spoke a little bit too quickly and too optimistically, sorry, the Biden campaign, if there's any doubt about where I stood, I just basically killed it, um, that uh, saying that he has promised to raise uh, uh, $80 million, Mauricio has, by private sector and, and in Congress. Um, some of the Biden campaign are saying that if he doesn't do that, they will move to get him, uh, they will move to get him removed as a president of the IDB. Believe it or not, I'm actually against that. I think there are too many elections that are overturned in Latin America, and it would be a bad precedent to have the same happen in a development bank. I think we're gonna to have to suck it up and, and actually find other ways to assist development in the region, which is a sad statement of how far we've gotten and how broken all multilateral institutions collectively, because the EU and other European countries are also donors, are in the region. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Christoph. And uh, last, Monica. From your perspective, please. Uh, I would I would add to uh, the pessimistic uh, view of multilateralism or more broadly cooperation in Latin America the fact that the dispute between China and the U.S. can feed into this uh, the, the 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 fragility of these institutions. I mean, one thing is going to co-produce the other. I think that it's quite clear that if we look at each country in Latin America, they are making different choices regarding the dispute between China and the United States. You just have to look at the Alcantara base in, in, in Brazil and the base in Argentina that is being used by China. So it's, 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 it's very clear that there is, of course, no coordination in terms of how these countries deal with the systemic uh, dispute and the systemic dispute will feed into the differences and the difficulty of relationship between uh, these countries. You look at Argentina, Bolivia, Nicaragua, Venezuela on one hand, you look at Brazil, Colombia, Peru on the other. I mean, this is, this is not new, but it is becoming worse. 
And uh, I think that we, we, we would or could at some point in time expect some sort of leadership from Brazil, but in the context of this government, it's not going to be possible. In the context of a more uh, open or progressive or democratic uh, uh, or even more traditional from the Brazilian point of view, foreign policy, uh, it would be it would be uh, a role to play in terms of some level of, of coordination regarding the geopolitical dispute in Latin America. I would just like to end with uh, the the environmental issue, which also should uh, be considered, and the difference uh, regarding who wins the elections in the U.S. will be enormous because in, on, in that in that field specifically, China and the U.S. may move in the same direction, and uh, a Trump administration and China are not moving in the same direction. Thank you very much. Uh, it's soon time to end, but I'm, I'm just curious. Uh, going back to how we started, whether this is the most important U.S. election in modern history. Is this the most important U.S. election for U.S.-Latin American relation in modern history? Three seconds for each of you. Anyone can start. Do you, do you, is that your impression? I, I remember that Hillary- I can start, yeah. I, can, I can start, I can start. But I go back to, I go back to my, my, my first point. I think it is, the most important in terms of uh, the role that democracy will play in the region and in international relations. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Who? If, if I can join in, I would um, definitely share the view of Monica that in terms of democracy and human rights, it would be fundamentally important, um, certainly in the US itself, and it may bring unexpected changes in, say, the way taboos such as racism within the U.S. against the, the Black American population and against Hispanics is now up in the air and how that will redefine dynamics, including the relation with Mexico and Central America. Um, that uh, could be one way. Um, uh, but there will be, as I tried to illustrate in my opening remarks, there are deeper trends that I think uh, will uh, continue, perhaps in a less uh, abrupt, abrupt or, or, or extreme uh, way, but that will most likely continue even uh, under Biden. Let me just quickly add to what um, uh, both Monica said. Um, the, um, I, I think you, it, this is important. Yes, the short answer quickly, Magnus, is yes. But I think there are trends that we will never put those back in the box, um, whether it's the reaction against immigration, whether it's America first and, and, and jettisoning or rejecting the idea of uh, trade deals or being hyper, hyper critical of trade deals. And trade was a tool of US foreign policy in the region for better or worse, going back to Ronald Reagan, um, actually going back farther, but more prominently during Ronald Reagan, that's never gonna come back. Um, the issue of the re rea racist reaction against uh, uh, immigrants has been unleashed and there's no putting that ugly monster back in the box. And in fact, if Trump is reelected, it will get worse, not just because the man will be holding not only a dog whistle, but a bullhorn, um, when it comes to racist tweets and the like. It will also, because all the things he's doing, whether it's um, not putting someone who's completely unqualified in the Inter-American Development Bank, downplaying development, engaging or basically encouraging corruption among cronies is going to fuel more migration. And so the reaction won't, the problem won't be just in the US Latin American relations. It will also be over the next four years, should he be reelected, even more racism and even more toxic behavior in the United States towards Latin Americans. And that's very, very troubling. Thank you very much. So, yeah, if Benedict, I don't know, I'm just waiting if you want to say something, a final. Yeah, not much to, uh, to add here, but I think, um, yeah, I was listening to a panel of, of experts on US policy, this politics this morning, and they said every election is the most important election, 
but also that you often don't know whether it was so important until after the election. Some elections have not been considered really that important and they turned out to be. But I think that um, it, it is, a, a, it, it feels like uh, the relationship between the US and many Latin American countries at least are at the turning point. Uh, seen from Central America, the US has, has this enormous, I think it's, it has a, an element of what of what Monica says about Mexico that it's it's kind of it's not really a, a foreign policy, not a foreign country. There's so many relations, it's so so extremely intertangled. But that what happens now in the U.S. will have major impact on kind of the survival of some of those those countries. There are in an extreme crisis, climate, security, poverty, and and it's kind of at the breaking point with even more hostility from. Uh, from the U.S., uh, I could see that it, it it turns the wrong way and moves to more authoritarian governments and even more uh, exclusion and, as Chris also said, more migration and, and more chaos. So I think that, yes, uh, these are really important elections, as most are, but even more important this time. Thank you very much. In one week, no. That is the election night. I, I guess there will be a few days more. Then we will know the result of the U.S. election. Interesting. I Florida will have a key uh, key role in this election. So the Latino vote will be important uh, this election, as as in many others. I want to thank the the panel for a very interesting discussion. I want to thank the audience for your attendance and your questions. And I hope to see you soon in the next webinar of the Nordic Institute of Latin American Studies. Good night. Just got to take off.